So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on the Richard session. Richard is the founder of Fever B, an international community consultancy, and the author of Batting Communities. Richard's clients have included Google, Facebook, Oracle, Wikipedia, EMC, Greenpeace, and many more. Prior to Fever B, Richard interested in set uh, coding in New York. So now some words about this. Uh, with data from Milton member from, from uh, 300 more communities, your business rich in Milton will showcase that what drives the highest level of participation in community. Uh, you will learn the kinds of discussion, content, and activities you can initiate and create to get maximum level of participation on, in your community. So, uh, <laughs> I let you the stage with your talk, Maximum Engagement, what really drives the highest level of participation in community. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Can I just thank you? I have never heard that sound effect before. <laughs> uh, can I can I just check that you can see my screen fine and it's full screen? Everything yes, everything is fine now. Okay, ciao, ciao, buongiorno, uh, good morning. <laughs> um, so I'm honestly a little bit conflicted about this webinar today, not because I haven't put a lot of time and effort into it, but because I think maximizing the level of engagement is not a goal that a lot of organizations should be pursuing. But I do think there is a maximum level of engagement that you can have for your community. So before we begin, let me get into the basics here. And it begins with something that I tweeted just the other day, which is there's a paradox of engagement to a certain extent, where everyone wants more engagement except the members of a community. How much engagement does an organization really need? How much engagement do you actually need in your community? Most of the organizations I've worked with over the years have tended to say the same thing. They want more. It doesn't matter what level they have today, they always want more and more engagement. But we find you can actually build a very successful community with relatively low levels of engagement. I wrote a huge post about this back in February, I think, which you can read here. But there are some key points I would pull out of this. And to organizations, the less engagement you have, the fewer problems you tend to have. The more engagement you have, the more you have to deal with some moderation issues and liability issues. And even many platforms, they charge you by the level of engagement. So it gets more expensive over time. And the less engagement you have, the more focus you can have. You can focus on just the audience you have rather than the audience you don't have. And what we've found in all the data that we've collected, and believe me, today I'm going to be sharing a lot of data, is that often just 300 active members people that truly believe in your community, that are truly committed to your community, is enough. And even to members, having, fewer, having less engagement, having fewer members can be a huge win. There's often higher signal to noise ratio. There's a greater sense of exclusivity. There's more of a sense of belonging. It's easier to stand out and get noticed in a relatively small group than it is in an absolutely massive group. So before we even think about increasing the level of engagement, I would think about how much engagement do you really think you need? Because more engagement in itself should never be the goal. Engagement should always be in service to a bigger goal. And a lot of organizations, they have to find that sweet spot between what an organization needs in terms of satisfaction, retention, knowledge sharing, more developers contributing to different projects, and then what, an, what members actually want in terms of solving problems and seizing opportunities and getting more social improvement or validation of what they're doing. And then what a community can actually do, which is giving people an incredible sense of influence, giving people an incredible sense of belonging or mutual support. And I think there's a danger if you're just pursuing engagement, that you end up in that bottom section there, the engagement trap, where you're measured by the level of engagement that you're trying to generate in your community and at some point, that is going to stall. Engagement cannot increase forever. And a successful community, a successful brand community, exists in that sweet spot in the middle between what an organization needs, what members want, and what communities can actually do. And you probably need far less engagement than you think. And so it raises the question, how much engagement do most brands actually have? 
when we talk about the most successful online communities, we usually talk about these organizations. We have huge levels of engagement and participation. And over the past year or so, we've been looking at this because I had a theory that a lot of communities had nowhere near the level of engagement than that as what they claim to have. And this is what we found. And this will vary tremendously by different types of communities and all those kind of things. But typically, a community on a fairly large or one of the big platforms that are out there, Vanilla, Chorus, Salesforce, and Discourse, um, this is what we found on average, is that it varies tremendously. But typically, in terms of the number of posts per month, we're looking at something between 7,000 to 12,000, but it does vary quite a lot. And in terms of active members per month, or people that actually make a contribution, we're looking at something between 45,000 and 5,500 members. But what we're seeing is that there's a lot of variability here. And we're seeing when we break it down by different kinds of organizations, and so I don't have any developer-based communities on this, but when we break it down by different kinds of organizations, what we typically find is that there's three different tiers. You have the tier one communities, the mega communities, the communities that are getting over 10,000 active users per month. Then you have the tier two uh, communities that are above the 2,500 level per month. And then you have the tier three level. So you're, when you're thinking about how much engagement you should actually have in your community, I think you have to figure out which benchmark makes the most sense to you. Are you a tier one, a tier two, or tier three community? Because once you figure that out, it becomes a lot easier to figure out how much engagement you should actually have. And one of the easiest ways to benchmark how much engagement you should have is look at how much search traffic there is for your name. One of the things we spent a lot of time on um, over the summer was looking at tools like SEMrush and SEO tools that are out there to figure out, figure out how often is someone searching for a particular brand name, then how many active users are there in their community? Because I had a feeling there would be a really strong relationship between these kinds of um, metrics. And that's exactly what we found. There's a very strong relationship between the number of active users in the community and how many people are searching for that brand in the first place. And this is quite important because it gives you a good idea of how much engagement you can expect. What we found is that around 45% of the variability in engagement can be explained by how many people are searching for the brand in the first place, how many people have questions, how many people have information that they want, which means there's only a certain extent to which you can influence the level of engagement. And that's around the 55% level. And what that means is that there's things that you can control and things that you can't control. And things that you probably can't control are things like how many customers you have or how many members are likely to be engaging or are likely to find your community in the first place. How big is the total size of that audience? And the second one is how many problems do they have? A lot of people, when they visit a community for the first time, it's because they have a problem they want the answer to. And you often can't control that as much as you might think. But alas, that is often how engagement is measured. Engagement is often measured by, I'm oh, sorry, we're often measured by how much engagement that we can create. And there's always this temptation where you can almost always gain more engagement in your community if you want, but the real question is, if you, do you really want that? And I think for most of us, we should have a little bit more engagement than what we're getting at the moment, but there should be within a fairly reasonable limit of what's possible. A few years ago, I read this terrific book called Getting Everything You Can Out of Everything You've Got. It has absolutely nothing to do with online communities, but the mentality of using all the tools and the options we have to drive more engagement is quite important. And I want to apply some of these principles and philosophy to this webinar today. And what I'm going to walk you through are a couple of steps that we go through with several of our clients to increase engagement, ranging from the very basics to some of the more advanced stuff. So let's begin with the fundamental levels, which is too often we jump to a big, expensive, and risky change instead of just doing the basics better. Too often we move platforms or launch some big initiative instead of simply doing the basics better. And so fundamentally, if you can change one of these things, the total size of your audience, or how many of them you can reach, or how many questions that they have, then this could have the biggest impact more than anything else. If you have the power to change these things, this will have the biggest impact on the level of engagement. But it probably won't happen. But there are things that we can change. 
there are ways that we can expand or narrow the scope of the community. And if we want more people to visit more often, we have to satisfy more of the needs of our members. If you're seeing any of my talks before over the last year, I've talked about this a lot. The biggest win in increasing engagement is often changing the very scope and nature of that community. So take a typical um, brand community or a typical community. People will often visit when there's a problem and they need help. A lot of communities exist at that bottom left level here. But if you want people to visit more often, what you need to do is expand the number of questions the community can answer. Because a community that's only based around a problem and people getting an answer are communities that people will only visit when they have a problem. But if we expand this out, if we expand the scope of that community, we can achieve much better results. So for example, people that have a software problem and need help are also very probably in similar careers as well. So if we expand the community to cover career questions and problems they might have, that's going to get people to visit more often. They may also feel a sense of belonging with this group and have other off-topic discussions they want from people that they trust. So when you progressively expand the scope of your community to satisfy more of the needs of your members, you're going to get more people participating because there's more value. Fundamentally, there's more value in that community. But then you can also satisfy more of the desires of your members. Getting people to visit more often isn't that difficult when you expand the needs. But if you want people to participate more often, if you want people to stick around for longer, you have to, have to satisfy the desires of your members. And there's that initial need, and then there's that, that, that um, external desire. And so people that are solving a product issue or have a problem that they want a solution to, at the desire level, they want to feel more competent. And if you go beyond just solving the problem and give them advice and knowledge and expertise to feel more competent, they're going to spend more time participating in that community. And then beyond that, there's the identity level, where this community is a part of their identity, or at least a very specific part of that community. It's for people that want to feel part of a group who are excellent at solving product problems. If any of you run a MVP program or a super user program for your top members, what you typically find is that the super users are in this top left box here. They have an identity about being great at solving these kinds of problems within a community. But even if we go down this, people that have a career problem and need immediate help, they probably want to feel respected within their company and earn a promotion or have these kinds of goals. And you can change these verticals to whatever makes sense to you and your sector. But fundamentally, if, you've, if your community also becomes a place where I can satisfy these needs, then people are going to participate more frequently and more often. And at the identity level, they might want to belong to a group of the top professionals in your field in the world. And so you can see how it goes from the problem to the external need and then to the identity level. And even lifestyle, where people feel a strong sense of connection with one another, they tend to continue participating, stick around in that community for longer. So hopefully you can see that fundamentally, there's lots of cool tricks and tactics you can do to get people to be more engaged. But fundamentally, if you want more engagement, you've got to change how much value the community is offering its members. Because this directly impacts what happens in your community as well. If we look at a typical um, need, desire, and identity um, problem in terms of the value of that community, they offer the need, let's imagine a DIY-based community. Um, someone might start a discussion, they want to drill a hole and put up a shelf, and they don't know what drill bit to use. And then the typical content in this kind of community would be the ultimate guide to drill bits. You might have challenges and, and activities with an ask me anything with Bob drills a lot, your top expert. And this is the kind of community people only visit when there's a DIY problem they have. But if you expand the type of discussions you create to, I want to create a room which looks good, what are your tips, or the top 10 interior storage tips, or how to share your um, storage tips, or 24-hour challenge design your top file hole in 24 hours, suddenly it's not a problem. It's not just a community you visit when you have a problem. It's a community that's satisfying your desires. There's a reason to visit that community every single day because it's satisfying your desires. And then you can also think about the identity level such as who are the top most creative interior designers in the world, or what will the future of interior design look like, or voting for your top person, or having a webinar with the top experts. So you can see you gradually progress from the need to the desire to the identity. And if you want people to stick around for a really long time, that's the level we want to be going for. We want to be gradually expanding what people actually get from the community, satisfy what people really want initially, 
and then slowly expand beyond that. And even if we look at the data from communities, very often we go straight to that identity and the friendship level, but I would caution against that. Almost every single survey I've seen from every client we've ever had has said the same thing, which is people rank making friends and building relationships very low down when it comes to a community. That's one of the few things that is important, but isn't often the reason why people visit a community. Often they want information and getting valuable information is as valid as anything else that can happen. So we want to be focusing upon that in a community, at least initially, and then you can expand beyond that. But if you get the information side right, if you get people sharing great expertise and knowledge within that framework we've just shared, that's the sweet spot I think that's going to really change things. And so the biggest wins come from changing who the community is for and what the community is about. All of the technology changes, all the other processes and super user programs and other activities that you can try and implement I can be very useful, but the fundamentals are quite clear. The biggest wins come from changing who the community is for and what the community is about. The next thing that really matters, and I don't think this is going to be a surprise, is having a good community manager. Years ago, when I created the Feed Be Online community, I had someone terrific to manage that community. And she was doing a great job. Then around 2017 or so, she left to take a new job at, at Discourse. And I decided not to replace her. And for the last couple of years, I've been removing the bad stuff, but the community has generally been managing itself. And you can see the results of this. The moment that the community manager left, the level of participation plummeted. I don't think you can get more obvious data than this, which says it's important to have a good community manager. And also, imagine if I didn't hire a community manager in the first place, I don't think this would even have happened. So it turned the community that was growing quite steadily into one that was dying quite quickly, just through the results like this. And so you need a good community manager. Compare this to the opposite, where a community that didn't have a good com community manager actually hired one. And you see us at the Mayo Clinic. You can see his community was pretty much dead. And then they hired a great community manager, Colleen Young, who is fantastic. And immediately the level of participation and activity in this community exploded just by doing the basics right. And I think so often we overlook the basics and try to do these big programs, but just doing the good things well. A community manager that is highly trained, that knows their staff, that knows how to drive engagement, because it is an art and a craft in what we do, has a huge impact, perhaps more than anything else. Another thing that is quite important are black swan events, um, events that you can't predict. You can't rely on them, but they can also have a big impact upon engagement. If we go back to the data from this year, I think we can all see very clearly there's a COVID-19 bounce here. But will it last? I don't know. But you can't predict these kind of events, but they can have a big impact on the level of participation. So let's say we've done the fundamentals at this point. We've changed the scope of the community. We've got someone great managing that community. What's next? I think what's next is the retention rate. If we can't get people to stick around in a community, it's going to be very hard to build a community that is getting the level of engagement and participation that we should be getting. And most communities, I'm sorry to say, have really terrible retention rates. Most newcomers that participate for the first time will never participate again, which means there is an incredible opportunity for improvement here. Retention rates do tend to naturally increase a little as you grow, but as we look at the data here, we find that sure, it might increase from say 20, what's that, around 20 or 30%, yeah, around 30% here, up to around 42%. Um, but the difference isn't really that huge. But yeah, as you grow, the retention rate is a little, probably by people getting quicker answers to questions. But this is the biggest increase for the newcomers of that community themselves. So you can see, you might begin with something that's around 30%, but as you grow naturally without doing anything else, your retention rate should increase, but you could do a lot more to have a much higher retention rate. We've always been able to increase the retention rate by 15 to 20% with most of the clients that we work with. And so there's a couple of key steps involved here. One is making sure every question gets a response. It blows my mind how often we've worked with a prospective client, and I love all of my clients very dearly, 
but they'll complain they're not getting the level of engagement that they want. And then when we look at their community, we'll find dozens of questions that don't have a response. If you can't get questions, good, quick responses, you're probably going to suffer or struggle to get people to stick around. When we looked at the data of this, the return rate of users who get a response to their first contribution compared with those that don't, the data is so clear. It couldn't be more apparent than this, that if you want people to stick around, you have to make sure they get a good response a, or at least a response to the first question they post in that community. And if you can't do this, you should stop doing everything else you're doing until you do this. At the very core of our work, we should be doing this. Don't overlook this because it has a huge impact. We also looked at the speed of response. Does it matter how quickly people get a response? And what you'll notice throughout this whole webinar is we're very data-driven about this. We have some assumptions that we work with, but we're very data-driven. So when someone makes a post, if you make a post in your community, how quickly do you need a response to participate again? And we looked at this too. And this is what we found, is that the data is pretty clear on this as well. And so we begin all the way on the bottom left over here. And what we found is that the chances of a second participation from a member, if they get a response within the first two hours, is around 58%. But then what happens? Well, after 18 hours, it begins to drop from 58 to 55%. But what you'll notice is this small window way up here, the top left, where it doesn't change that much to around 18 hours. And so what I would say as a rule is that if you can get members a response within 18 hours, that's the baseline that we should be working with. Because after that, the chance of a member ever participating again begins to plummet really, really fast. After three days, it drops to around 48%. After a week, it drops to 41%. After two weeks, it settles around 36% and continues to very slowly decline after that. But I think it should be really clear. You need to get your members quick responses. Two hours would be the world class level. Within 18 hours, I think, is a level we can all be aiming for. We also looked at the quality of response. Uh, the quality of response also matters a heck of a lot. Um, accepted solutions really do matter. You have a platform that let you mark an answer as a best answer. And this has an impact, but I don't think it is um, accepting a solution that matters. I think what really matters is the quality of response. So all this raises a question, is, is, which is what can you do about this? What can you do about this? Not me, what can you do about this? What are some practical steps you can take? One, I think, is to begin benchmarking yourself on this scale by the non-response rate and the average time to first response. You need both because if you only track one metric, you're going to distort your results significantly. You can just respond to one to one question and have a really high time to first response. So benchmark yourself on this scale. Generally, the bigger you are, the more difficult this gets, which is why some of the top communities are really at this bottom left here. Uh, Fitbit, Alteryx, uh, Sephora, these kinds of communities are really well done. And then if you can, create filters for members making their first contribution to that community. Some platforms like Chorus, um, Discourse, uh, Vanilla, and others let you do this um, in, in the back end. So create filters, and you can run this at the beginning and end of your day to find members who have made their first contribution to that community. I think Discourse even gives a nudge, actually, for people who have made their first contribution. And then make sure they're getting good quality responses. I can share this framework uh, that we use after the session today. But if you can train yourself, your team, and your top members to give responses that are at this level, that are personalized, that are friendly, that show good levels of knowledge, that have a resolution uh, within the response as well, and give members a sense of influence, this is what really gets people to stick around. What we try to do with clients is put a sample of their last post, uh, maybe the last 10 to 15 posts, and then we start looking at that, sam that sample, see how they would benchmark today, and then provide them the training, the advice, and the motivation they need to improve their responses. Because there is an absolutely huge difference between responses like this and the responses I'm about to show you. This is from the old Yahoo community. What do you notice about these responses? They're not bad. I mean, they give the information, 
but they miss this incredible opportunity to build a bridge of understanding between members, to make that member feel they are, they are welcome, to show a level of empathy, to get people more engaged in that community. I think too many people mistake community management for customer support. And these people are doing customer support. They're not managing a community. Now compare this to Colleen Young. Colleen Young, who had that graph that was exploding in participation. This is what she has done over 7,000 times. What do you notice about this response? Take maybe five or 10 seconds just to skim through it. What you should notice here is all the little things in play. She's at mentioning the person, she's personalizing. She's identified as their first contribution, specific reference to the question, and she's tagging in other people to respond. Think about how difficult that is. She has to have a whole system to know who to tag in. She provides a link to more information, and then she encourages them to participate again. This is the level I think we need to be at. There's clearly a huge difference between these kind of responses which don't encourage that member to get more engaged ever, and this kind of response, which every single one of us, just through the power of our words, can have a big influence over. When it comes to accepted solutions as well, be careful how you use them. I think if you look at the GeoTab community on the left, it's very clear this is a community you want to participate in, everything seems answered. With the Claris community on the right, when only one has an answered tab next to it, it doesn't look good. So I think you have to use it and commit to doing it really well. And that means you're probably going to have to be marking most of these answers as the best answer, or you have to do it not at all. But you have to choose which one works for you. Next would be getting newcomers to initiate a discussion. I know I'm going a little bit fast because we're a little bit short on time today. So get newcomers to initiate a discussion rather than replying to an existing one. What we've found is that members who start a discussion as opposed to applying to an existing discussion, are 7% more likely to make a second post. So we looked at the data. When people uh, start a discussion as their first contribution instead of applying to a discussion, they tend to stick around for longer. They're also 8% more likely to reach 10 posts. And we've seen there's a compounding effect because the more people that stick around, the higher the retention rate tends to be anyway. So this has a compounding effect over and over again. But what if members don't have many questions to ask? Well, what a lot of people do are these newcomer discussion threads. And these threads actually work oh well. I used to be very much against them, but the data shows that they have, actually have a really good impact, which is members who reply to a non-welcome discussion made an average of two discussions in the community and posted nine comments. When we compare this to members who did make their first contribution in a welcome discussion, we found an average of eight, eight discussions what they made and posted 149 comments. So onboarding activities generally should guide newcomers to either start a discussion or reply to a welcome discussion. When people first join a community, these are the two things I recommend you get them to do. Part three is how you personally stimulate more activity within that community. This is where there's a lot of good data. So let's do the basics. It's better to ask a question than make a statement. When we looked at the subject titles of all the discussions that were appearing in communities and the level of response, what we found is that those that had the question mark indicating a question had a significantly higher um, number of responses than those without. We also looked at the subject title length as well. And what we found if you're posting discussions, actually the length of the subject title matters, but the post length, not so much. So if you look on the left here, this is how long the title of a new discussion or a thread sh should be. We found there tends to be a peak at the 80 char char character level and then at the 300 plus. So what I would say, 300 plus gets into um, a strange place. But if you're starting a new discussion, around 80 characters is probably the best length that gives enough information without overwhelming someone. In terms of the length of the post, it doesn't really matter. The length of the post itself, as opposed to the discussion, doesn't have a big impact. It tends to rise a lot towards the end, but I think that's primarily because our data is less data that um, exists at that level. So these are some outliers. But around 80 characters seems to be the sweet spot here. 
We also looked at, does it matter if a staff member or community member starts a discussion? And honestly, it probably depends upon the community. In the eBay community, the discussion started by the moderators um, clearly got more uh, responses. In the EA Games one, they also got more, but it didn't have a big impact. It probably doesn't matter if you're starting discussions in the community as opposed to a member of the community. Next, we looked at off-topic discussions. We tried to look at as many things as we possibly can. Um, off-topic discussions were really difficult to pull data in about. Um, so we looked at one community where it's very clear which was on topic, which was off topic. And yes, off topic discussions can get more responses, um, but they can also drive pe people away as well. So I'd be a little bit careful about diving too deep into this. Um, yeah, off topic discussions can create a lot of noise to low signal. Next, we looked at the question words within discussions themselves. So one of the things we looked at was how, um, what was the number of responses to questions containing each of these words when the subject line contained what, how, why, where, when, or which. And what we found is that what questions, where people were asking what they should do or what they could do, got a, high, sorry, a far higher number of responses than any other type of discussion we looked at. And I think that's because what discussions are just asked for your opinion. What do you think about this? What should you do about this? It's asking for someone's opinion, and everyone has an opinion. It's not difficult. But then we looked at how frequently these question words were showing up. And what we found is that how showed up far more frequently than any other type of discussion. And I think what this means is that whilst a lot of people can jump in and, and share an opinion about what you should do, what members actually want is how to do things. They want the factual stuff, or they want the valuable stuff. And so focus on how to do things and finding people that can answer these questions, that's a big win that's going to get you the right kind of engagement over the long term. Now, in the limited time we have left, let me do the more advanced stuff. And if at any point you need to cut me off during this, please let me know. But we've got around a few slides left. One is to do a regular audit of what's popular in your community at the moment. What we found is that top landing pages matter. So if you were to look at the landing pages in your community and search for those in the form in Google Analytics, what we found in this example is that 21 discussions account for 75% of all the inbound traffic. So it makes sense to double down on these kinds of discussions, the discussions which are already most popular and are already driving the most participation. We can also look at what do members engage with most, or what do they find most helpful. And in fact, what drives short-term value can be very different for what drives the most value over the long term. A while ago, I worked with a client um, who were obsessed with doing these VIP webinars, and I wanted to create these more product resources. But we tested this once, and what we found is that the VIP web webinar we did had a huge spike in the level of um, activity and the traffic. But over the long term, when we started counting up how many people have visited each session over the long term, whilst it looks like the webinar was a lot more successful, at the cumulative level, sure, there's a 10x spike initially, but at the cumulative level, over the long term, is that the product resource was a big win. And so when we research the members and find out what they want, what they find most, va most, most valuable, we find that over the long term, if you can create dozens of these useful resources in very specific areas, you'll have far more acquisition, far more people visiting that community than any other way, um, any other type. And typically, in my experience, the most helpful content are things like case studies, analysis and breakdowns, templates, resources, surveys, data, and interviews. But you should always be measuring the time versus the outcome here. So double down in areas with the most level of activity. And to wrap things, I want to talk about super user programs as well. I know we've covered so many things so quickly, but I think if you have a super user program or a program of top members, the common mistake is to get your group of super users together by the highest, the most activity, and then try to get them to do all of the things, things that often they haven't done before. And a far better approach is to run multiple programs within your community for different goals. 
SAP, for example, is champions, mentors, um, alumni, and advocates, and all those kind of things. What I would recommend you do is, sure, if you want more activity or more responses, then a super user program tends to work well. But you can also do a program for group leaders. You can also do a program for the advisory board. You can also do a program for advocacy. You can also do a program for influencers. Having just one program doesn't tend to make sense. We can said you can just let members join which programs make sense to you and then customize everything that happens within that program just for that audience. And I think that's where the biggest win is going to be. I know that we're out of time. Um, what I would also say is that the design of the website also matters a heck of a lot as well. Getting the design right is critical. Um, so I'm not going to cover it here, but if you want to follow up and watch a session on that, then you can do here. And um, wow, that's a lot of information really quickly. Um, if you want any more help or guidance for building your community, then please um, you visit feverbead.com. We do strategy, we do community experience, we're trained um, over a thousand community professionals and helped um, over 300 organizations at this point build their community. I don't know if we have time for any questions, but if anyone wants to jump in here, um, please feel free. Thanks a lot, everyone. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It was, uh, and your keynote, so uh, it was uh, really interesting. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you because we have not much time for questions. Uh, we have to go <laughs> yeah. to the next. Uh, so thank you for being here. And if you want, you can watch the other session. We have also sessions. Sounds good. <laughs> And uh, so uh, I ask you for all to all attendees to go on session and watch the next one. So thank you Thanks very much, Rachel. Bye. Bye.